Good morning. Praise Jesus Christ. We thank God for his mercies. Actually, if there is any good reason, we need to be very grateful to God and very appreciative to him is his mercies. Because <clears throat> They are from everlasting to everlasting. And his masses are not dependent on anything that you have done. He is unfailing love. Thank you very much for joining me. And may God bless you. Yesterday, we had a time to talk about caroused heart. And uh, these are the topics that God has given me as we are laying the foundation for the year 2024. And today we are talking about breaking snare altar or breaking altar of delay. Breaking altar of delay. Many people are having some life experiences <clears throat> that do not have tangible explanations why the things are the way they are. Yesterday, that was on, uh, on, on, on uh, today is on that, on the night of the 1st January 2024, that night, leave around the, that first, the first night, I had a dream and I was sleeping on my bed and I saw something made like a, like a box. You see the way the bronze altar was made, that, that setting, the bronze altar, the way it was made and where the sacrifice is put, I saw many filthy snails. A northern raised by sacrifices of snails. And I woke up. My sleep left me. I was startled I, I, I became afraid. And, 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 and I, I wanted to understand in that condition or in that state, what is the meaning of that? Because it was an altar, but altar of snakes. And the Spirit of the Lord expounded it to me that uh, there is an existing altar of delay. There is an existing altar of the but made by snails. So snails there is a picture that is revealing to me what has been making my things take too long to happen. Psalm 58 and verse 8. Like a slug melting away as it moves along, like a stillborn child, may they not see the sun. He's saying, like a snail or a slug, melting away, as it moves along. So meaning, we can make every snail to melt away by the fire of God. Imagine you have been wanting your things to respect and observe set times. But despite doing all that, <clears throat> your things keep on experiencing postponement. So you find you are taking too long for something to happen. And even to some extent, they never happen. Then yesterday, I happened to visit a friend of mine. 
And when I was there, her son, or who was washing the utensils, started to scream, saying, there is a very big frog at the door, kitchen door, and it is looking at me this way. Huh? Her mother used the, the table room door to go on, on the side of the, of the kitchen. And when she met the frog there, she ran away. She came calling me. Servant of God, come and help me here. And I went there. And it was a huge frog, like the size of this head of mine. I went to hit it. The Holy Spirit told me, pray first. I prayed. I took the full armor of God. Then I removed it, all it to the road, and I killed it. At around 10 p.m. in the night, she SMSed me again, telling me, the same, same her son has seen another frog at the toilet area, but has vanished. They don't know where it has gone. So meaning, <clears throat> there are things that have been put in people's lives with a certain agenda. And these are witchcraft altars. When you see a snare altar, there is a, day, there is a time, 2022. I had a dream where I was staying just outside the house. There was a small tank there. And I saw in the soil a small hole dug there but it had been filled with very big snails, this size. Snails, big, big. Many. And let me tell you, that brought people go through abject poverty and diseases and divorces. So these altars are real. And they manifest according to the sacrifice that was used. Now you find that one is the altar of frogs. Serious witchcraft. The same, same house I'm telling you. By the time I was vacating, on the last day when I had removed everything, I went to release myself from using that toilet. And I found a very big frog, the size of this head, at the corner of the toilet. And I realized those are the spirits that were functioning. And later my wife had a dream, like one week later. She saw a very big cobra, very big python, a very big python snake at the gate of that plot, very big, that was producing a certain sound. One week after that dream, we were told a pastor we were living with there has been admitted to hospital, seriously sick. Another pastor who was also living in the same, same plot has divorced. So these things, we may take them as superstition because of our naivety about spiritual matters. But they are real. They are not the stories. And I want us to destroy all these altars. And by the way, the ministry of altars destruction is a firm instruction by God himself. Altars must be broken. And uh, this is one of the messages that the devil does not want to be preached. Because he knows as long as we are functioning under the control of altars, he knows we are a Controllable by him. 
I was saying that altars first kings If they are not broken, there will always be something that will stand against those people that they will not be able to conquer. And this is a very serious issue. Sometimes we see like Orota issues is just a, is just a, a story of manipulation. But these things are real. <clears throat> it's only that there are people who do not have any orators they deal with depending on the generation from which they come from. Or there are those who those orators time of functioning have not yet come. But there are people who are already in the battle of orders. Judges 2 verse 2. Let us read from verse 1. The age of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bokim and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I sought to give to your forefathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down the altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? Now, therefore, I tell you that I will not drive them out before you. There will be thorns in your sight, and their God will be a snare to you. I want you to, 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 to use this scripture, or I use this scripture, to base my, my, my argument. God had given the children of Israel an instruction that when they arrive in the land of the promise, the first thing they need to do is to break the altars of those, that land. One will ask you, what is an altar? An altar is a center of operation concerning dimensions and dynamics of life. It is a place of rife transactions. It is from praise, it is a place from where transactions of life are done. So imagine your 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 your, your dynamics and dimensions and dispensations of your life are done from snail altar, from frog altar, from chameleon altar, from tortoise altar, from the altar of witchcraft and sorcery. That is from where you arrive draws instructions that it governs your life. That you find there are people who are born again. They are literally born again. But the life that they are living is not an example. It's not an example of salvation. It's not an example of salvation because they are living hell here on earth. Pray Jesus Christ. They are living a life of suffering. That if you look at salvation and the life of this individual, there is no relationship. There is nothing that shows this person is born again. If you look at this, God is saying, when they refused to break the order, God had said, I will keep my covenant with you if you break the orders. So when you don't break the orders, be they witchcraft order, Sorcery order, family order, ancestral order, generational orders, clan orders, tribal orders, or, 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 or territorial orders. If you don't break them, that order makes it impossible 
for the promises of God about you fail to come to pass. They are never fulfilled. I said, I will not break my covenant with you. And you shall not make a covenant with the people of this, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you disobeyed me. Why have you done this? It's a question the Lord is asking. Why have you done this? Now, therefore, I tell you that. I will not drive them out. So, if you read these few scriptures, they are about three. Three verses. Raise the basis of the effects of an broken altar. Number one, God does not keep his covenant. Yes. God does not keep his covenant. Promises in you are never fulfilled because the altar is, is, is a repairant. Number two, you get covenanted. With the people who subscribe to those altars, even if unwillingly. You do not want, and that's what you find nowadays, people are going back to Dadaya Gaidai, Dadaya Gaidai. They are going back to that system. Because the unbroken altar connects you to them. Those ancestral worship systems. Number three, if you note here, when you have this altar unbroken inside you, you disobey God. Anybody who is in this altar, they don't obey God. You think you are obeying God, but you are always amiss. Number four, you said that, I will not drive them out before you. Deliverance becomes impossible. No matter how many times you will be done deliverance, those demons inside, they are never cast out. Because the altar is the illegal ground. That's what he's saying. You have refused to break the altars? Yes. Then I will not drive them out. So as long as the altar is inside a person, the altar stays in your spirit. Altar is a foundational spirit, is a principal spirit that instructs, governs, directs, and controls your life. The spirit that determines the result and the outcomes of your life. Yes, your mind want this. But the reality is this. Now, that which brings the reality that you see is what we call the order. Disobey is you disobey God. And the deliverance becomes difficult. You'll be moving from one church to another. And every church you go, there will be a demon that will be being casted out. And then something he says, there will be thorns in your sight. Diseases becomes your portion. Thorns there is a picture of diseases. You are always ill. When these altars are there, you will see the, the, the things that you can use to, to note they are there, ni, ni precurrent diseases. Seasoned, seasonal or seasoned diseases. And then he says, and their God will be as near to you. So you find you are easily trapped. You are easily ensnared by religion, by other deities. And these are the people who try to strike a balance. Gaiwa Kirenyaga, Nai Jesus Christ. You try to balance. They are God to be as near to you. That is the order that manifests that. In a person's life. Can we look at Isaiah 22 because 27 verse 9? Because I, I, I want to talk <clears throat> several things, <clears throat> but in a very brief manner. Because there is another that altar I saw, the altar of snails. I want that the altar receive the bombardment of the fire of God until it is completely destroyed. And I'll give you some few tools that we use to destroy altars. Just few. He said to the seven verse nine, by this then will Jacob's guilt be atoned for, and this will be the full footage of the removal of his sins. What is that? 
When he makes all the orator stones to be like chalk stones crushed to pieces, no Asherah pole or incense orators will be left standing. Did you know that? God is saying there is a sin that you may try to deal with using repentance and self-control, but it will never be imputed. It will never be remitted. He said, only by this shall that sin be atoned for. Shall that sin be removed by breaking the altar. So, altar and the broken altar makes the host sinful. A bearer of the sin that instituted that altar. So if it was done by the great grandfather and we are in that lineage, everybody who is his seed bears the burden of the sin of instituting that order. Until you break that order, the sin committed remains in you. That's why you find there is a sin you have tried to conquer, but you never conquer because it is an altar based sin. Look at verse 10. The fortified cities stand desolate because of the altar. So we are, we are, we are, we are trying to, to make ourselves see some of the things we can look at. I have already talked about this topic in the YouTube, but. Uh, because of that revelation I had yesterday, I had to talk about it again. We are not going to be controlled by altars of delay. He says, this altar, when it is unbroken in a believer, key number one you have said, there is a sin that you never overcome. Number two, you are fortified this day, stands disorate. Meaning, where you are supposed to prosper and excel, that is fortified city. Fortified city can be a picture of your CV, your academic papers, your skills, your experiences, or your business, or your ministry, or your family. But he says that one shall start disorate. You enter into disoration. Something else says, abandon the sentiment, forsaken like the desert. Where a altar is an inexistent, the beer of that altar is always isolated, is always alone, is always abandoned, is always forsaken. These are the people you note in life. When the time of trouble comes, they have no one to assist them. He says, they are the calves grace. There they lie down, they strip its branches bare. When its twigs are dry, they are broken off, and women come and make fires with them. These are the people who don't have any right. They don't have right to life. For these are people without understanding. So the maker has no compassion on them. And the creator shows them no favor. Not here. The order. He is saying, unless that order is broken, these are the things that you shall see in your life. He is saying, you lack understanding. The order makes you not have the understanding of five dimensions. And then, it makes God have no mercy on you. You pray, God have mercy, God have mercy. But as long as that altar is inside you, you don't attract the masses of God. And he says, and the creator shows them no favor. When you are, when you are bearing that altar, and it is unbroken inside you, you don't walk with the favor of God. The creator shows them no favor. And we are praying with these things. With these things. So you find there is a rejection that you always keep on fighting. And you never overcome it. There's so many things that I want to, to talk about. I, that's why I am briefing you. That's why I'm briefing you. Matthew 15 13. 15 13. He replied, 
every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Pray Jesus Christ. If God is on, we're saying, as long as that tree that bears bad fruit, which is we are calling the altar, as long as it was not planted by Heavenly Father, Jesus is saying he is a New Testament priest and he is saying must be uprooted. Must be uprooted. It is Jesus himself who is saying, and in our days, we are having this tendency to speak against the gospel of altars, and especially those people who have made it in life. They are having a total disregard of this message because they don't need it. Pray Jesus Christ. Orotas must be broken. Because once an altar is established in your life, once an altar is established in your life, there is a struggle that, my friend, you can go through and you don't really understand. Why am I going through what I'm going through? There is a verse I'm looking for. I don't remember where it is written. And it's the one that I'm looking for because it is very important. Pray Jesus Christ. I found it. Her. Thank you, God. So let us look. Why is God saying we approve these altars? There's a text that I've entered there of a gentleman who is crying to God and asking, Hoi, 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 hoi. Let us read Judges chapter number six. Judges chapter number six. God, find a way out for this. Let somebody get the solution they require. Judges chapter number six, verse 25. That same night, the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's heart, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to bar, and cut down the Asherah poles beside it. Before you continue with the other part. So God is telling Gideon, There is an altar belonging to your father. Meaning, Gideon's father, Gideon's father, was a territorial priest of Bar. And God told Gideon, the problems that you are, I'm sending you to go and counter the Midianites is attracted by that your father's altar. So if you do not break that altar, the problem that have raised you to go and sort out, you will be limited. And if you read from Judges 6 from verse 1 all the way to around verse 18, you can draw some of the things that this altar of Bar were making these people go through. And number one is Midianite innovation. Demonic, serious demonic innovation. Number two was oppression 
that all time was dictating they be oppressed by the Midianites. Midianite invasion, that is demonic attacks that you cannot resist. And number two, oppression. They don't just attack you, but they oppress you. Number three was a shelter problem, shelter issues. Because they went to live in mountain crafts, caves, and strongholds. So where this old is, people don't have proper residential places. Unafugiwa nyumba kila wakati. Something else you note with this altar is that uh, it attracted extra demons. The Midianites came with the Amalekites and other Eastern people. So you find you can have multiple demonic attacks. So you find there is a demon called Midianite that is attacking you in the line of finances. But it attracts other demons which shall attack you and manifest in different versions. Another thing you note is that uh, they were impoverished. They were impoverished. That means where this altar is, there is abject poverty. You get me? Something else you note from this, I'm, I've read it, that's why I'm trying to pick them out. You will note, with this altar described in the book of Judges, chapter number 6, is that people live in fear. Timidity. People become cowards where they are supposed to express courage and confidence. You find you are always afraid. But you don't know why. Gideon was hiding. Number th something else you note is that uh, you will find it with someone that is an altar, you are always in the wrong place. You operate from the wrong place. Because the Bible says he was dressing wheat in a wine press. Wheat dressing is done at the dressing floor. But wine, grapes, are pressed at the wine press. But him, he was dressing wheat at the wine press. So the platform is for wine, but he is using that platform for wheat. So you, you are always in the wrong place. You could be doing the right thing, but in the wrong place, meaning it never comes to stand. Something else you draw from Gideon is that where this order is functioning, you doubt God. You doubt and question God. And you reject yourself. Gideon is doubting God. You know the story of Gideon. He doubted God until he told God, I want evidence. Prove. Something else is that you are afraid and you question God a lot. Those are just some of the things that you, we can draw from Gideon's story. Because if you look at um, in verse 20 in the morning, when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar, demolished with the Asherah pole, beside it cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly Rabushka de Gredia. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did this. Did it. The men of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Another thing you note, where there is this altar, when you attempt to destroy them, they react with premature death threats. I've used the term threats. Where they are. There is always that attempt to provoke early death. There is so much we can talk about this, but we don't have so much time. Let me just look at Deuteronomy 12 verse 3, because what I want to give you is the tools, because we can speak so much about these altars, but if we do not have the means to break them, then we are just speaking stories. 
Deuteronomy 12, 3, 4. Deuteronomy 12. Break down the altars. Let us start from verse 2. Destroy completely all the praises of the high mountains and on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. God is the one that is giving firm instructions. Break down the altars, smash the sacred stones, and burn the Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. You must not worship the Lord your God in the way. What does that tell us? These altars have the capacity to compromise our Lord God worship standards. You must not worship the Lord your God in the Yahweh. Do you get that? That's what God is saying. Destroy them. Destroy those altars. And God is even specifying for them. So that when they get there, they don't enter into any confusion. God is telling them these, these, these need to be destroyed. High places, high mountains, and on the hills, and every spreading tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, burn the Yashara poles in the fire, cut down the idols of their gods, and wipe out their, even their names. God is saying, wipe them out. Or because he's saying, you must not worship the Lord your God in the Yahweh. So if you do not break them, and these altars in our lives, you may tell me, can you just show me that altar so that I may understand what I'm saying? It's not something, in today, in those olden days, they were visible because they were something physical. You could see the mayor, you know, you know a, 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 a tree where people, they would go and do their sacrificing. Those kind of shrubs where they could go and do their ibandas. Mm. There are those centers of worship, caves, there are the locks, there are those rocks where they go and they slaughter, they spread the, um, the meat there and they burn it. You know, in the olden days you could say, but in our days, because of civilization, what there is it, we are not raising new altars, but we have carried in the blood. We have carried in the spirit. We have carried in the names. We have carried in the behaviors. Those altars. So in today, you need just to study the sequence in your life. In terms of behavior, that you're fighting alcoholism, adultery that you are trying to overcome, you can't. You know, and if you look at that undertale, you can just locate it in your grandfather who was polygamous. He had three wives. So you today, you will not have three wives, but you'll be finding something inside you burning to needing an extra woman apart from the wife you have in the house. Now that is an altar. Because it is something that is beyond your control. Behavior is a very simple thing to show you, about to, 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 to teach you about the altar. Something else is the language, the words. If you look at the, 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 the language you use, and you look at the language of your family members, you will note there is a lot of familiarity and similarity, even if you are born again. There is a way you just speak like them. Even if you are a ranet, behaviors, even if you are ranet and born again, there is a way you just behave like them. Reasoning, mindset is another thing. You just think the way they think. And sometimes you find what you are thinking, somebody in your family may be called by the same name you are called, was thinking about the same thing. Those are we call, now we call today, we call them strongholds. They, are, they operate in mental stronghold areas, moral stronghold, character stronghold, lifestyle stronghold. You look at the lifestyle that you are living, it can speak something to you. 
and many other things. Like life manifestations. You are fighting with poverty that you cannot explain. Debts that you cannot repay. Diseases that are chronic and terminal. There are so many things that you can look and they can try to direct you. And despite being prayed upon, there is no change. That's how you know there is an altar. And that's when are, and to make it simpler, we call them strongholds. Because of the term altar, people are run it, so they try to de-associate with that because it looks somehow as... <clears throat> as, as it's a kind of kind of it's atheist. It is kind of atheist language, but it is true. And God is saying, if that altar is in, you are born again, yes, you are born again. You are born again. <clears throat> but if the altar is not broken inside your spirit, because it functions in our spirit, in our soul. That's why you find you, you can dream about something. You can deserve something. And you can operate in a certain way. But the outcome is always something else. Because you can never manifest something outside. Something outside the principal order inside you. You only manifest because the spirit that controls life in the realm of the reality is produced by the altar inside a person. Because inside a person, there are two indwelling spirits. The human spirit and the Holy Spirit of God. You get me? But the life of a person depends on the human spirit. Because the Holy Spirit comes to back your spirit. And the spirit in a believer or in a person is processed or emanates from the altar inside that person. So if the altar has not yet been broken, what you see, you don't see the altar. You say, this is the altar. You see the manifestation of that altar. So if you stand there, the things that you are seeing in your life, they conclude the work of an altar or a stronghold. So he's saying, you must not worship the Lord your God in the way. So meaning, when this altar is unbroken in a person, it compromises a person's worship. You try to, to balance between Gaiwa Kirenyaga na Yesu Christo. You try to balance the two. That you can go and slaughter and still come to the church. That the custom and, and, and religion, they are joined at the hip. No. There is no relation between Beriar and Christ. Deuteronomy 7 verse 5. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 5. He's saying, we can start from where? There are so many things we can read. This, 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 this chapter is very heavy and very deep, but we are just briefing. When we, when we go to the church, we will not be in a hurry. When the Lord your God, let us start from verse 1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess, and it drives out before you many nations, these are the demons. The Hittites, Gigasites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Seven nations larger and stronger than you. Those are the seven types of demonic forces that when you come to Nairobi, you have to fight. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. It is a command. Destroy them totally. No mercy, no pity. Make no treat to them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry. This is when we do it. We do it wrong. Marriage. Marriage is a sensitive thing. He saying, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Why? 
For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. So there are very many people today, they are not, they are not fighting their generational orators. No, but they are fighting the orators of their spouses. Yes. Before you married that person, or you got married that person, your wife had a clean sheet. It was on a clean sheet. The moment you married that person, things changed. And today you ask what went wrong. It's simply because in intermarrying, you graft yourself through marriage. For the Bible says you shall become one fresh. You, you graft yourself to your spouse's altars and you now become officially belonging to that altar. That altar starts functioning in you officially as it functions on anyone else belonging to that family. Because you become part of that family by the authority of marriage. That way, in, in the case of marrying, you, you, we need to have a lot of discernment. This is what you are to do to them. Not to me. It's a scripture. Determine 7 verse 5. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, Smash their sacred stones. Na nyuba mingi zinakuwaga na sacred stone. Cut down their Asherah poles. Nyuba mingi zinakuwaga na hii muti. Wa Asherah pole. Kuna muti kwa boma. Huwa haukatwi. Hata migine ilikauka. Na muti mwingine ni muzee sana. Unanaka kama yu wakekoyo. They have a tree called Mugumo tree. This is a Asherah tree. It is a dated tree. And it burn their idols in the fire. There are people still today who are holding to those me and no. They are only being called idols. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the nations and all that and all that and all that. It is a firm instruction from God. So what do, we, what do we take from here, from this verse? If you don't then break the altars, what happens in your life is that uh, you marry long. You marry long. The altar will connect you with another person who has an altar like you was. Because altar works together. Altars works together. That's why you're saying first, before you, you do anything, first break those altars, then marry. Because if these altars are not broken, what happens is that if you read Judges 2 from verse 1, 2, 3, and 4, if you read it, say, I will now not drive them away. So there will be the and there will be thorns on your sight, meaning there will be interactions with them. And that's why you find it today, we are saying we are separated so much, so we are intermarrying. Tribal intermarriages, clan intermarriages, even families are intermarrying, incest. And God is saying, it will connect you to the altar. And what will happen to, the, to that is that the, the altar provokes God to anger. Somebody who has these altars we are talking about, the Lord's anger is always on that person. Not on the, the person specifically, but the altar inside the person. That we said, where that altar is, the compassion of God is not drawn. It is the love of God that is there. Because God's anger is always fuming against the altar. So, and you are now the bearer, you are the carrier, you are the host of that altar. So you find you are always under the consuming fire of God. But on the principle of lamentation 5 verse 7, look here. Something you are saying that he will quickly destroy you. Those altars are the one that he brings sudden fall. Sudden fall. From nowhere, 
without notice, something happens and everything about your life crashes sudden and will quickly destroy you. Those orators are the ones that are responsible for emergency and notified destructions. You find you had a very good career. You just wake up one day and you have nothing. You have no one. You have zero. You go back to square one and you don't have any means to rise up again. Because orators always attract. Always attract sudden destruction. And you also said, where these orators are deliverers casting out of demons, and you can see there are seven dimensions of demons, is difficult. It's, he said, I will not drive them out. So somebody with a note, huh, fighting deliverance, is just like, uh, you are just exposing yourself to more ridicule. Deal with the altar. Destroy the altar. You do not need anybody to pray for you to cast out demons. Because they stand on the altar. Let's, let us just read something here. Exodus 34 verse 13. Exodus 34 and verse 13. 34 and verse 13. And verse 13. Let us read it from verse 11. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorite, Canaanite, Hittite, Perizzite, Hivite, Jebusite. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going or there will be a snare among you. Break down the altars, smash the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah posts. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jairus is a jealous god. Two things you draw from here, if you refuse to break these altars, he is saying, number one, there will be a snare to you. If you don't break them, they become a snare to you. These are the people who make brandas. You make mistakes that you cannot explain. And it costs you everything about you. Pray Jesus Christ. There is something I was reading here about Moses. So, we have said, if these altars are not broken, number one, they become as near to you. These are the people who live arrive of mistakes because there is always a snare there is always a trap there is always a net that arrests you number two do not worship any other god for the lord whose name is jealous is a jealous god you attract the jealousy of god so god walks with you in jealousy consuming fire i'm trying to brief you but this is so deep mm -hmm. Go to my YouTube account and study. I've talked about it in details. Deuteronomy 16 verse 21 to 22. Do not set up any wooden Asherah pole beside the altar you build to the Lord your God. And do not erect a sacred stone for these the Lord your God hates. For these the Lord your God hates. So God hates contrary altars. So you cannot build to God an altar when you still have another altar. Meaning, if you have this unbroken altar inside you, and you have ever raised an altar to the Lord, that altar nullifies or cancels the God's altar. And you know there is a king in Israel who did that. He raised another altar. He had seen from somewhere else, from Damascus. And the, the Lord's altar, he put it aside, and he placed this altar, you get that? 
So they were, he was serving God from the both. And God destroyed that king. Because you, two altars cannot be in the same temple of God. It is one altar at a time. So if you came and you got born again, and Jesus became an altar inside you. And the altar, the original altar, had not been broken. That's why you find you want the altar of God inside you to flourish, to function, to work. But it is not working. And you find the things from your family are the ones which keep on following you. It's simply because God hates that altar. Then the Bible says, for this, the rod your God hates. There is a time I was telling some people, what if you come to realize that the enemy you are fighting is God himself? What? Can God be my enemy? Yes, because of the things that are inside a person. You could find that the one who resists you is God himself. And all these are a type of altars. And God is saying, I hate them. So imagine you are the carrier of that altar and God says, I hate that altar. So that hatred will come upon who? The carrier. And the carrier is you. And God has said, I am a jealous God. And he hates that altar. So you come to the man of God, you offer a sacrifice, raising an altar. And there is another altar inside you. God has said, he hates that other altar. So what will happen? This new altar you have raised to God does not work. Because it is already the muzzled. Because that other one is there legally, by bloodline, by name, by family programs. So until it is crushed, until it is smashed, until it is overthrown, until it is destroyed, it continues to remit the altar of God. Because God now is coming as a newcomer and he wants to be permitted the way that other altar was invited and permitted to operate. Somebody will tell me, but God is almighty. Who can stop him? I know. But God is a respecter. He is not a respecter of man. But God has given man the power of free choice. You can make your decisions. That's why he's saying, I am at the door knocking. Whoever hears me and opens the door for me, I will enter. As long as you don't open the door, he cannot enter. Because God does not force himself into a person. Even if you are born again, every dimension of life, you will experience God according to your free will in allowing God to have a say in that area or dimension. If in that dimension you do not accommodate God in that level, God has nothing much he can do. That's what you find. We experience God according to how we are growing in God. Exodus 23, 24. Exodus 23 and verse 24. Do not bow down before... We can start from verse 22. Let us start from verse 23. My angel will go ahead of you. My angel will go ahead of you. And bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittite, Perizzite, Canaanite, Hivite, Jebusite, and I'll wipe them out. Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God and his blessings will be on your food and water. And I will Take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I give you, I will give you a full lifespan. It is on the look at those promises; they are conditioned on. The Lord has put it this way. 
You must, and the term they use is a must. It's not a request. It's a must. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. You break them. You break them. Smashing them. Smashing them. Demolishing them. Demolishing them. Is if you do that, there are blessings behind that. He's saying number one, the number of blessing is God blesses our food and water. Number two, I will take away sicknesses among you. Number three, none will miscarry. Number four, none will be barren. Number five, I will give you a full lifespan. So what if you refuse to demolish them and break them? These five blessings don't apply. Yes, they are there as a promise. They are there as a promise. But you find when these orators are there, you experience scarcity. Number two, you experience chronic diseases. Number three, you experience miscarriages. And these, these orators are the ones which are behind abortion. High rate of abortions in our life. Because we are doing abortion to service those orders. Because we are those abortions, those babies, those footers eh, and embryos, they are sacrifices eh, to those deities. Because they are the one which we are being sacrificed to with the children, sons and daughters. The Bar, Asherah, Chemosh, Morek, Dagon, on those kind of gods, Queen of Heaven. The next thing you should find is that uh, barrenness will be there. So you find you walk with sterility, economic sterility. You are a barren. Your hands are a barren. And something else is that uh, people die early where there is an order. Premature death. People die early. Instead of a full lifespan, what if the order is there, you get the opposite of full lifespan. So people die early. Numbers that the verse fifty two. Let us start from verse 15. On the prince of Moab, by the Jordan across from Jericho, the Lord said to Moses, Speak the Israel and said to them, When you cross the Jordan into Canaan, drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. Destroy all the carved images and the cast idols and demolish all the high places. Why? Take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess. Distribute the land by rot according to your crowns. To a larger group, give a larger inheritance, and to a smaller group, a smaller one. Whatever falls to them by rot will be theirs. Distribute it according to your ancestral tribes. Something else you need to note here is that God is saying, when you cross there, you go, you come from the village, you come into Nairobi. Okay? God had told you this. Destroy all the carved images and cast idols and demolish the high priest here in Nairobi. So we came in Nairobi. We did not know the altars or the spirits that are a principle in Nairobi. So you did not handle them. Actually, we came and adopted them. We integrated ourselves into them. And now then we come later and we get born again. And we are trying to handle them. He is saying, the reason why God is telling them, destroy them, he is saying, so that you may have the ability to take possession and settle. He started by telling them, destroy and demolish. Then take possession and settle, for I have given you the land to possess. So you might find there is something that God has given you. Something God has given you. Has said you will prosper, you will be great, you will be this, you will be that. 
but you never become. Because you get the ability to possess and the ability to settle down. I mean, to be established when those altars are in absentia. So if that altar is present in your spirit, number one, a, instead of possessing, you become dispossessed. Transfer of destinies. People say that that message is, 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 is a, a bad message. Bra, 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 bra. But the Bible has taught very much about the transferring of destinies. It is transferable. Actually, there is a one who speaks a lot of arrogance. So number one, when these altars have not been demolished, you don't take possession. You don't have the ability to possess. That altar, that altar, dilutes your possession ability. Unenda kushika kitu, arafu kina slide of your hands. So you find you always, you are always about to possess something. You are always about to receive something. Then something comes from nowhere and you don't have it. And it's gone and gone and gone and gone. Because the altar makes you not have the ability to possess. And number two, you never settle down. Somebody who's, who have not destroyed these altars. And I'm speaking of in your own sphere. I'm not talking about you come in Nairobi and destroy all the altars in Nairobi. No. I'm referring to your own operations. So that those altars in Nairobi, they don't have any touch or any connection with you to control you. So to them, to those altars, you are untouchable. Get that? You never settle. You are never established. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> can't finish. Second Kings chapter number 10 and verse 27. Second Kings chapter number 10 and verse 27. <clears throat> and verse 27. Let us start from verse 25. As soon as Jehu had finished making the burnt offering, he ordered the guards officers go in and kill them let no one escape so they cut down with the with the sword the guards and officers drew the bodies out and then entered the inner shrine of the temple of Baal. they brought the sacred stone out of the temple of Baal and burned it they demolished the sacred stone of Baal and tore down the temple of Baal and the people have used it for aratrini to this day guy so Jehu destroyed bar worship in Israel. Hallelujah. That's a solution, huh? See you. That's a solution. So let us not talk about it. We will come later and we'll be talking about the, the, the things that you use to destroy those altars. But you know how, how, how those altars affected Israel. We can just read from uh, huh. let me just show you something small from first Kings chapter number 16 and verse 32. He set up an altar for Bar in the temple of Bar that he built in Samaria. I have also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. So, you know the story of Ahab without going very much in the scriptures reading them. I can just highlight some of the things that he followed Ahab because of <clears throat> setting up an altar for Bar in the temple of Bar and for raising up a Sherapo. What things followed Ahab? Number one, we can stand it that he provoked God to anger. That one is without any contention. The moment that altar is in existence inside you, the Lord's anger is always on your head. That's the way the first for 40 days fasting. Because not that God is angry with you, but God is angry with what is inside you. Number two, 
you fight with the servants of God. Somebody who is hosting that orator inside them, their, their spirit, you never agree with the servants of God. Ahab and Elijah became enemies, sworn enemies. Actually, whenever they meet, they call each other my enemy. You are first enemy. Whichever church you go, the person that fights you is a pastor himself. And that one I can tell you it is true. Number two is economic farming. You attract yourself farming, drought that you cannot handle. That altar attracts economic drought. Something else that altar attracts is premature death. Remember, Ahab was killed by a, a strain arrow. You just accidentally in a tomb, It attracts premature early death. Something else you know about the story of Ahab. His children, all of them were killed in one day. Seven of them. And you know what happened with Ahab is that his family, Irisha Ivo too, the whole family, there was no continuation of that family. The lineage stopped. The anointing did not flow to the next generation. Because from there, after the, his two sons ruled for a while, the anointing shifted to Jehu. <clears throat> 2 Kings 23, verse 15. 2 Kings 23 and verse 15. <clears throat> Let me just see something there. Mm. 23 and verse 15. Uh -huh. Even the altar at Bethel, the high praises made by Jeroboam son of Nebat, who had caused Israel to sin, even that altar and high praise he demolished. He burned the high praises and ground it to powder and burned the Asherah poor also. Okay, I want us to go to that altar at Bethel in the first Kings chapter number 12. And we see the effect of that altar. Number one, it becomes a brokerage of worship. Let us read somewhere. Second Kings chapter number 12, that altar at Bethel. That altar at Bethel. And verse 28. First Kings 12, verse 28. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. Two golden calves. Uh -huh. Remember the one of Aaron in the, in the desert. He said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One is set up in Bethel, and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people went even as far as Dan to worship the one there. So what do you learn from that? When that altar was raised, when that altar is there, it brokes you from Zion. So this altar will always broke you from accessing the realms of God. When the nation split, they could go to Jerusalem to worship God there. He raised an altar of calf at Bethel and one at the, at the Dan. At the Bethel, we know Bethel is a house of God, isn't it? It's a, it's a, Jacob called it the house of God because it was under open heaven. There was a land there and the angels were ascending and descending and the Lord was at the gate of heaven and he spoke to Jacob there. That's why he raised an altar. Meaning, this altar broke Portals of God. In other words, these altars broke people's open heavens. When this altar is in your spirit, you don't walk under open heaven. Because it breaks you from accessing the realm of God. Jerusalem is the realm of God, Mount Zion. But there is a note at the Bethel stopping people from crossing there at the Bethel house of God. But that is where the altar has been laced. 
Meaning, these altars, when they have been laced, they broke your access to God. You may try to walk with God in different dimensions, but you cannot because the altar broke you. Hosea 10 verse 2. Their heart is deceitful. And now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones. Let us read from verse 1. Israel was a spreading vine. He brought forth food for himself. As his fruit increased, he built more altars. As his land prospered, he adorned his sacred stones. The heart, their heart is deceitful. So when this altar is inside you, your heart functions with the deceit. There are so many things written down there. We will not look into them because of our time. But where these authors are, deception is in another level, I'm telling you. You will be lied to and you will be a liar. Somebody lies to you and you fall into that trap. So is Can we read the verse, it's still in Hosea 10, verse 8. The high praises of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. I told you, this altar, those and these stones will grow up and cover the altars. So where the, these altars are, you will find thorns and these stones, illnesses and diseases. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us, and the hills fall on us. That way people are always going to prayer mountains. But nothing is changing. Mountains cannot help us. If you climb the mountain, where you are bearing a northern, you are just actually... You are actually destroying yourself for nothing. But you don't fast. For handle the oro takwanza mugu alisema every plant that has not been planted by my heavenly father will be uprooted start from there first of all uproot that tree that is in your system uproot that altar uproot that stronghold uproot it then you go to the prayer mountain you will come with the answers so then man of God what are we going to use to destroy these altars What are you going to use? Me, I will give you very simple things. And some of them will, will, will sound strange to you. But it's the truth. Number one, a sacrifice. Number one, a sacrifice. There is no breaking of an altar without a sacrifice. Just look at the Judges 6. The instruction of God himself, not me. Number one. Verse 26. Then he built, he's saying, mm -mm, he's saying, verse 25. Take the second bull from your father's all heart, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to burn and cut down the Asherah pole beside this. He's telling him, take that bull, using it, tear down the altar. So you can go to tear down the altar and resist you. Because the altar knows what destroys it. Then build a proper kind of an altar to the Lord your God on top of this site using the wood and all that. Verse 27. So Gideon took ten of his servants and he did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of him, of his family and the men of the town, he did it at the night than in the daytime. Two things or three things that you need to use in destroying this altar. Number one. Have intercessors around you, even if they are family members. Gideon took 10 of his servants. They went to destroy the altar. You don't destroy the altar alone. Let there be people who shall help you in intercessory. Number two, have a sacrifice. Have a sacrifice. Don't go to attack altars empty-handed. They will react against you. And it might be dangerous. Number three, 
after you have broken the altar, build a new altar, he told him. Because if you don't raise a new altar, the altar that you have destroyed tends to grow up again. For Jesus said, once a demon has been cast, it goes. And if it doesn't find a place to stay, it comes back to look at its residence. And it comes and it finds clean but empty. It goes for other seven demons worse than itself. And they come and they lodge there. And the situation becomes worse than before. So it is all one, one of the ways of breaking an altar is building another altar. But you don't build another altar if the other altar is still existing. So you start by destroying it. So intercessors, they help you. Number two, the sacrifice you use destroys the altar. Then number three, you raise another altar. Why? To occupy the space so that it cannot be occupied again by another altar. Because we are still bearing their own items, the names, the bloody DNA, and all those kind of things. The next thing is authority of calling. Authority of calling. Exercise the authority of your calling. Jeremiah 1 and verse 10. This is a tool you use in destroying altars. Uh, see, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So God is telling Jeremiah to tear down, to destroy, to uproot and to overthrow. Use the authority I've given you. Exercising the authority of a believer. Luke 10 verse 19. The authority of Jesus Christ. So exercise that authority. But be very careful. First of all, start by taking the full armor of God. The next thing I would encourage you to do is activate your angel. Exodus 23 verse 24. Activate your angel. Don't destroy these altars around. Who is instructing Gideon to destroy the altars? The angel of the Lord. Many people don't have angels. Because these altars, you might not see them physically. And if you see them spiritually, you might not see them in their entirety. But the angels can see them in their entirety, even to no matter what generation down the bloodline. The angels can see. That's why the angel is important. Look at it in Exodus uh, 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 23 verse 24. 23 and verse 24. This is what the Lord said. Uh, 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 23 verse 23. 23 and verse 23. And verse 23. He's saying, My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorite, Hittite, Pesite, Canite, Hivite, Jebusite, and I will wipe them out. So who will wipe them out? The angel of the Lord. Look at it in verse 27. I will set my terror ahead of you and draw into confusion every nation you enter, you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their back and run. I will set the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivite, Canaanite, and Hittite out of your way. So that hornet is one that is being called the angel of the Lord. So activate the angel of the Lord. Like Gideon, it is the angel of the Lord who is telling him, go and do this Go and do that. Use that. The angel of the Lord is very important. Today, we use the Holy Spirit. The next thing is the anointing. Anointing. Now, this is not the anointing, the olive oil. This is the anointing inside you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And that says the Lord to King Cyrus, to his anointed King Cyrus, the anointing inside you. Let us see it. We, this one we, we borrow from, from Jehu. In 2 Kings 10, we borrow this from Jehu. Why was he able to destroy the altars? 2 Kings 10 verse 27. 10 and verse 27. Uh, hey. Is it verse 27. Uh, hey. They demolished the sacred stone of Baal and tore down the temple of Baal and the people 
have used it for Eratrim to this day. So Jehu destroyed Baal worship in Israel. So what enabled Jehu to destroy Baal worship in Israel? We go to 2 Kings 9. Mm -hmm. And verse and verse 6b. Let us just read from A. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anoint you king of the Lord's people, Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and to avenge the blood of my servant, the prophet, and the blood of all the Lord's servants, shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will be we will perish, I will cut off from Ab every last meal in Israel, serve or free. I will make the house of Ab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her <coughs> on the plot of, Je of the ground of Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then he opened. So, what enabled Jehu to destroy the bar worship in Israel, whose priestess was Jezebel, the anointing? The anointing. There is an inner anointing inside us. That's why Paul is telling Timothy, fan into frame the gift of God that is inside you. That gift, that anointing inside you. The moment it is in frames, you use it to destroy those altars. And they, 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 they adhere to you. But if the anointing inside you is dormant, imagine you will speak to those altars and instead they will attack you instead. The next thing <clears throat> that we use to destroy authors is man of God. Identify a good man of God who have authority. We see it in Exodus 32, verse 24. Uh, yeah. Exodus 32, and verse 24. Okay. Not verse 24. Remember what Moses did? He, he ground the calf idol into powder. Let us read it from verse, from verse 27. Exodus 2 verse 27. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, Each man trap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one head to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. Do you see the, the work of the altars? You kill each other. The river did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the mountains. Perhaps I can make atonement for you. So Moses went back to the Lord, but now forgive. Now read these people, who punish. Mm -hmm. Verse at five, and the Lord struck the people with the prague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. So we know the story. How Moses ground the calf idol into powder and made the people drink. From that cup. He made them drink from that cup. So to destroy these altars, that is what I was saying, you need a spiritual authority. A man of God with a spiritual authority. Who destroyed that cup? It was Moses. That that ground or grinded the cup into powder and threw that powder in the water. And made people drink from that. Nobody else can destroy those altars. That's why we need we need straightforward servants of God, men of God, who have who have seriousness in the work of ministry, and who have been called to this level. That's why you find it was Moses who destroyed and judged. Hmm?
it is something that the Lord has spoken to me that I was writing down. The next thing that you use to destroy an altar is drinking the living water. Holy Spirit. John 4. This woman, we know from Samaritan, she was heading, she was she had some 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 marital problems, marital breakdowns. She had like five divorces. But through she is telling Jesus in John 4, where her problem emanates from. In verse, in verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have, not, you have nothing to draw with and the world is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the world and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and hands? And Jesus is telling this woman, whoever drink this water from this well will be thirsty again. So the reason why this woman was suffering from divorces and the people of this city were suffering from various diseases and backsliding and they were non-believers is simply because of this well. Because the Bible says in verse 6, Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down the well. It was about the sixth hour. And the woman was under the control of this Jacob's well that he gave to his son Joseph. Remember, Whose well is this? Jacob. What spirit did Jacob had? Polygamous. And this woman is suffering that fate from one marriage to another. That is polygamous spirit working. And Jesus told her, as long as you continue drinking this water, you will be thirsty again. So you will be in the next marriage. How did Jesus destroy that spirit inside this woman? By giving her the living water. You drink the living water, the Holy Spirit. Because it is described there in verse 14, verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Because the problem is the well. Remember the well at Jericho. The well, the spring. It was the altar problem. So as long as they were drinking water from that spring, they continue to experience unproductivity and miscarriages. But the moment a senior, a servant of God with the spiritual authority, Elisha came, he treated that order. So that's why I said, spiritual, a man of God with the spiritual authority. But here is the living water. But whoever drinks the water I give him we will never last in need. The water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And this woman drank this water and she became an evangelist. Instead of a divorcee or a marriage breaker, somebody who is suffering from the spirit of polygamy and undertale, she became a great evangelist. And he made the, and he made the whole town of Samaria, was it Saika, the whole town of Saika in Samaria, receive salvation. When you drink the living water. The next thing is the death of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus Christ. This is what we call a cross of Calvary. No. The death of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus Christ. Matthew 27. Matthew 27. These are very important. Matthew 27 and verse 15. And verse 50, see, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. So he died. So what happened when he died? At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. That is a form of an altar. Number two, the earth shook. The earth, soil, the curse of the soil. Soil is a form of altar. And the rock split. Rock. We, have, we, we talked about the sacred stones. They, they, they split. The tubes broke. These are altars of premature death and early death. The tubes broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were restored. So what brought this operation? The death of Jesus Christ. How do you participate in the death of Jesus Christ? Through baptism and eating his body and his brand. The next thing you require is the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross itself. Colossians 2 and verse 15. Colossians 2 and verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, we can read from verse 14. Having cancelled the written code, the written code is an order. The written code. Kwe tu tunafanyanga hivi. 
na kwetu idi na kuaga mutido ngen mi with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us he took it away nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross so these altars they don't hear anything else apart from the cross of jesus christ take your cross go and strike those altars so how do you how do you then activate the cross of jesus christ is by accepting crucifixion to the cross of jesus christ by dying to self something else you need is faith faith luke 17 verse 6 luke 17 and verse 6 this is what jesus say he replied if you have faith as more as a mustard seed you can say to this mulberry tree a picture of a norota because jesus said every plant that father did not plant shall be uprooted be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you so faith is a tool that to use in uprooting those altars praise jesus christ so when you you do these ibandas without the revelation that is why they backfire against you something else is activating the divine power activating the divine power second corinthians 10 verse 4 to 5 activating divine power for the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world on the contrary they have divine power that is the full armor of god the weapons we fight with this is a full armor of god full armor of god because it's the, the weapons we fight with the helmet of salvation the breastplate of righteousness the belt of truth the boot of the gospel of peace the shield of righteousness the shield of faith and and the sword of the spirit the weapons we fight with he is saying they have divine power to do what to do what to demolish strongholds to demolish altars to demolish strongholds we demolish argument and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of god and we take up every thought to make it obedient to christ so because altars operate in the soul in the mind in the mindset attitude conscience consciousness feelings emotions that is where those altars operate from pray jesus christ hallelujah <laughs> so we have said what so you need divine power that's what jesus told them and you shall receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you activate the power of god in you ephesians 3 verse 20 and god is able to do immeasurable much more we can imagine with that we can imagine pray or even ask according to his power that is at work within us so it is according according to his power that is at work in you. so there is a power inside working in you when that power is working you can now use that power to tackle these altars for these altars are powers so they require another greater power than themselves something else is the ark of covenant the ark of covenant the ark of covenant you need a covenant with god that is first samuel chapter number 4 No chapter number 5 not for chapter number 5 mm-hmm. chapter number 5 I will not read the whole chapter but I'll direct to read chapter number verse 4 first Samuel 5 4 let us read from verse 1 let us read from verse 2 then they carried the ark in the Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon when the people of Ashdod rose early the next Are the next day there was Dagon fallen on his head on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord they took Dagon and put him back in his place but the following morning when they rose there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord his head and heart had been broken off and we are lying on the threshold only his body remained so what broke Dagon into pieces the ark of covenant and you can see that the ark of covenant being used in the in in the, in the days of Joshua 
they used the Ark of Covenant to destroy an altar which was in the form of a war. In Joshua chapter number 6. And verse 2. Can you read from verse 2? The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, but this is what you have to do. Around the king and his fighting men, march around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Make seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in the front of the ark. In the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests bring the trumpet. When you hear the sound around breast on the trumpet, make all the people give a loud shout. Then the war. Then the war of the city will corrupt and the people will go up every man straight in. Because in the verse 1, the Bible said, Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out or one, no one came in. But if they went around the war of Jericho six times, and on the seventh day they go around seven times, carrying the ark of the covenant with the priest blowing trumpets, when they are leading the Ark of Covenant, the Ark of Covenant is a picture of the presence and the glory of God. The war will corrupt by itself. So what was the center of operation? The Ark of Covenant. People who don't have any covenant with God, the Lord God, you don't have any business in dealing with the altars. Psalms 50 verse 5. The next thing as we wind up, because of our time, we need the stone of God, the rock, Jesus Christ. We need the person of Christ. That is Daniel chapter number... Daniel chapter number 2. The book says... <clears throat> Let us read it from where? Verse 2, verse 42. As upon, 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 upon. There is, the, 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 let us read this verse. Where is it? Verse 34. Verse 34. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like a chaff on a threshing floor. In the summer, the weed swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. The next thing you require is the rock which is not cut by human hand, that is Jesus Christ. For Jesus is the rock. So you need to have Jesus inside you. He is the rock that destroys the family statue, the family altars, the tribal altars, the crown altars, the territorial altars. Yes. That rock, it hits that statue and smashes it to pounder smashes, reduces it into chaff. The rock. The rock. The next thing is the fire of God. We know that in Genesis 13 verse 10. Genesis 13 and verse 10. Sodom and Gomorrah is a picture of altars of adultery, sexual immorality. 13 verse 10. Huh? You know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, but I'd like to read Genesis chapter number uh, Genesis chapter number nineteen. And verse <clears throat> let us read it from verse verse twenty three, the consuming fire of God. You activate the fire of the Holy Spirit. 
By the time Lot reached Zoan, the sun had risen over the land. Then the road rained down, burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, from the road out, from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. So, what did God use to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? He rained burning sulfur. We need to activate the consuming fire. We need to activate the fire of the Holy Spirit. Because Sodom and Gomorrah is a picture of altars of sexual immorality in a family. It will manifest in different ways. Undertary, pornography, incest, LGBTQ. Get that? So that is sodomy, lesbianism, bestiality. They were all sort of sexual immorality in this family called Sodom and Gomorrah. But to destroy it, the Lord laid it down. Fire, burning sulfur from heaven, which was coming from the Lord. Fire of the Holy Spirit. Powerful. Powerful. We need the fire of God. Pray Jesus Christ. Rastri, I told you we need a man of God, but it is something we need to use. We need to use Second Kings, First Kings 13. It is a First Kings 13. First Kings 13. We can read it from what? By the word of the Lord from verse 1. The word of the Lord. By the word of the God. By the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel. So combination of two things. A man of God carrying the word of God, the Rema word. And we had seen the man of God earlier on in Moses, in Elisha. Now what we need is the word of God. As Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offering, he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord. O altar, altar. This is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will do that on you. Okay. Then let us read verse 3. That same day, the man of God gave a sign. This is a sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes on it will be poured out. You get that? Let us read verse 5. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God by the word of the Lord. Case closed. So to destroy these altars, you need a man of God with or by the word of God. Altars, you don't break them from your mind. You don't use your mind to destroy them. No. No, 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 no. You don't use mind. I'm thinking we need to go into a family and destroy altars. Can God speak about it? Petition God until he speaks. He expresses himself about that matter. And it is my sincere prayer. Yesterday we said, let us open our hearts to God. Let our heart be after the heart of God. Today, let us destroy these altars. Let us be deliberate. Because the moment they are destroyed, the moment they are broken, the moment they are smashed, the moment they are crushed, they shall open us, they shall allow us, or they shall unveil us, or usher us into a new realm of existence with God. We shall experience God without any measure, without any control, without any interference or interceptions. And that is when we shall start seeing God manifesting in reality as he is written in his word. The altar, it is a major obstacle. I don't know that orator was built using what is sacrifice because orators are, a, are a given official authority by sacrifice. They use snails, they use snakes, they use frogs, they use spiders, they use chameleons, they use chicken, others use goats, others use sheep, others use cows, others use human sacrifices. 
they cause people to abort or to miscarry or even others sacrifice their own mothers, their own fathers, their own brothers, their own sisters, their own wives, their own children. I don't know what was used to, in building that art. Others use human feces. Human feces and human urine. You get me? They use different things, hairs and all that. I don't care. Others use money. I don't care what the sacrifice was used in building that altar. My attention is we must destroy them. Whether they are personified or personalized altars, family altars, ancestral altars, generational altars, clan altars, village altars, tribal altars, even territorial altars, or even national altars. Whatever the altar that is holding you hostage, holding you captive, and is causing you delay, is causing you sabotage, is causing you suffering, is causing you rejection, is causing you failure, is causing you turmoil, is causing you divorces, is causing you diseases, hmm? and the treatable diseases, is causing you poverty and death, is causing you shame and humiliations, is causing you retardation, is causing you failure and destructions, is causing you stagnation, whatever it is causing you limitations, whatever that order is, and however it manifests in your life, we are destroying them in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. From here, I'm heading to a prayer center and I'm paying attention in demolishing these altars. Take authority. Let us face them for the victory is on our side. For if the Lord be for us, who can be against us? And in all these things, we are more than a conqueror. And the reason why the Son of God appeared was in order to destroy the work of the Satan. And this is the power that overcome the world, even our faith. And we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. For in all of these things, we are more than conquerors because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Let us arise in the praise of our authority and declare these orders must be broken by the power of God. In Jesus' name, Amen. Shalom. I'm Apostle George Hapame. My number is 112 May God bless you as we continue working together. In Jesus' name. Amen.